Hello everyone, System Chalk here with the, I guess, part six. I noticed uh, just taking a look at the um, little sidebar here, uh, this seems to be a long one. So I, um, I'm i recording this uh, earlier. I don't think week four started in roguelike. Uh, devs, Dev does the complete roguelike tutorial anyway. Um, but I wanted to, I'll do a quick uh, summary of things that have happened. There hasn't been too much that's changed in terms of the um, the tutorial or anything that I've learned. Um, and that's just because I didn't, I don't think there were as many questions um, from the previous ones. Um, but I will also say that there's one thing that I didn't catch up on. It's mostly just because I've been really enjoying doing this. And so I sort of felt a little bit of an itch to jump in uh, and do these tutorials um, but I don't know, there's um, the, the things that are remaining are, are probably more about my own long-term learning rather than the tutorial here. So I didn't see a huge benefit to holding back and potentially falling behind on the, the tutorial because my Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays are still um, regular stream days. So uh, I did write something on the roguelike dev, uh, sorry, our roguelike dev um, weekly posts, and it was mostly related to the use of the future module. So this is one that I took a look at on the documents. And uh, the answer, it was uh, Hexadecimal who responded. So I believe this is the maintainer of the TCOD library, which uh, obviously I appreciate both of them taking the time to do that work, because clearly this tutorial doesn't work without it, um, but also taking the time to answer questions. And some of them were suspicions that I had. So uh, for instance, um, I did observe that there was a TBD in terms of um, the typing. And yeah, so in that case, apparently you just keep an eye on that over time and that's where it comes uh, comes in. Um, and I mean, like, so sometimes the disappointing answer is like, yeah, you, this is this miserable thing in the, the manual that you couldn't figure out. This is the reference that you need to look at. So, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes it works that way and sometimes, you know, you just need to do the hard work. Um, I think there were also a couple of references there that made a little bit more sense to type hinting overall. And I have a feeling that once I have a better idea of the f uh, fundamentals of the type hinting, the uh, specifics that are added by um, by future are going to make some more sense. And then of course, one day uh, we'll live in the world where that's all just part of Python and we don't worry too much about it. Uh, so again, a uh, big thank you to the community because obviously I'm uh, an outsider just coming in and doing one of the less impressive versions of the tutorial, but I appreciate them taking the time to uh, to respond to stuff like that, especially when some of the answers wound up being, you know, yeah, just, you know, just read the documentation. <laughs> um, so there was that. Uh, and then one thing I'll just maybe ask um, for those of you who happen to be following this and maybe uh, Python mavens yourself, I've noticed that the behavior of Ruff is a little bit different both from advertised but also from previous installations that I've had. Uh, and I know the I know the extension for VS Code gets updated in that, but uh, I noticed some of the formatting things don't seem to hold as much. Um, yeah, so for instance, this is 83 columns. And I remember once upon a time, it would actually automatically adjust those. And uh, what I have noticed, there was one sort of guide in terms of setting up rough, but it did seem to have an old system for settings in VS Code. I'm assuming that VS Code doesn't change that much, but certainly when you, whenever I see a screenshot and it looks significantly different from what's going on, and I know it, there's a difference between the um, the settings JSON and uh, and the settings, so I, I understand that there there may be a difference there. Um, but I think actually the structure of the JSON file I was looking at was a bit different. So there may have been a change, there may not have been a change, but it was a, at a point where I didn't want to mess too much with the internals, because at least right now it's telling me when things are, are wrong. But if anybody happens to have a good resource for setting up rough, uh, let's say in the second half of 2024, um, that would be something that I would personally benefit from, because I am really trying to, one of the reasons why I'm doing this series is to have a little bit more practice setting up something serious and to make the most of the tools, right? It's a, a little bit like um, I gave an example earlier in the series. You know, I worked in an environment where there was a lot of Excel being used and, you know, I would use tools like Python, uh, specifically Anaconda, quite a bit more. But I never thought that that was an excuse not to learn Excel. And definitely one of the things that I like to think made me a better worker there was 
you know, just being able to use shortcuts, be able to use the tool to do my work uh, well, to do it quickly, um, and also just to, you know, make sure that there are fewer opportunities for mistakes, right? So if you individually calculate every single cell, it's kind of like doing the math by hand. Sometimes that's a good thing to do just to keep yourself sharp, but you always run the risk. Uh, I was always bad at this in, you know, calculus. You know, you do this big, ugly derivative and um, there's like that one line and it just sort of resonates through the rest of your work. And at that point, you know, you sort of, you sort of understand how to take a derivative, but on the other hand, you've also not got the right answer. And of course, uh, you need to get the right answer, right? If you're doing some huge financial model and, you know, there's billions of dollars at stake, um, it's not enough to say, oh, sorry, I, you know, I didn't carry the one. Well, I guess you wouldn't carry the one in, um, in a derivative. But, but yeah, like, you know, obviously you, you need to understand the concepts and you need to get it right. <clears throat> so, you know, being able to use things like arrays or being able to use the functions inside of, uh, of Excel just like you know, using uh, an IDE like VS Code, um, or you know, basically to be able to use all of these things that will make you more productive, uh, it lets you focus on the fun stuff like building a roguelike. But um, for me, because I'm I'm trying to push myself to that next level, my original use for VS Code was just I noticed when I had very very large uh, notebooks, it was a bit more efficient than trying to open them up in something like Firefox. <clears throat> So that was my my first step. And then, you know, I've started to move towards having a notebook open on one side and then writing a, a dot .py program on the other. And this is sort of the step where I'm doing something entirely as Python uh, scripts and I'm not running, uh, not running Jupyter at all. So this is, you know, just an opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about uh, other ways that these tools are used and hopefully make me a better programmer over time, which is why I'm calling out to those of you that might have some helpful tools to to bring me a little bit further on that journey. Okay, um, I guess I did wind up spending some time in an introduction anyway, but <clears throat> part six, doing and taking some damage. So there's a bit of a PSA for this. Now, I think this is still an older tutorial, but they, in this case, it doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be an update since this step here. So it's going to be a little bit of a grind, but I don't necessarily think this is a bad set of lessons to learn. So first of all, check your TCOD installation. Before proceeding any further, you'll want to upgrade to TCOD version 11.15 uh, if you don't already have it. This version of TCOD was released during the tutorial event, so if you're following along on the week, a weekly basis, you don't uh, probably don't have this version installed. So we can open a tutorial. <clears throat> And there's a couple of ways that I can find this. So uh, what I like to do, because I'm using Conda, um, and actually what I'm specifically using is called the Mini Forge distribution, but under most circumstances, I would just be using Anaconda. There's a little thing in terms of fees if you're uh, using it for profit, but I think most people who are likely to hear this probably aren't using it in a money-making capacity. And if you are, it's like 15 bucks a month. So that's not too... Actually, I think it's eight for certain versions. Not that I want to turn this into an anaconda uh, advertisement, but uh, org is the repository. Um, I think if I'm going to say something, I should say it accurately. So um, okay, it is fifteen a month. And it, there used to be like a an introductory tier, which was. So I believe, where was it? Hmm. They used to have more of an explanation in terms of, um, uh, they used to have a description in terms of what, version you needed at which point i've found like in terms of descriptions with people i think they had said that um you know again for some sort of um oh here, hang on here we go use of anaconda's offerings for an organization of more than 200 employees requires a business or enterprise license gotcha yeah so um i mean again there's there's more sort of enterprise stuff that was inside that anyway but i'd remembered something so yeah they got rid of one of the less expensive uh tiers 15 dollars a month if you're using it for um commercial purposes and then 
on the very odd chance that you are somehow running a 200 or more employee enterprise, watching some guy struggle through a, a, a roguelike tutorial, and you want to decide to pivot to uh, the Anaconda distribution, you're going to have to pay $50 a month. And may I recommend that you talk to your CTO and perhaps talk about the division of responsibilities. Anyway, sorry, like I said, didn't need to do that. But if I'm going to make claims, I should probably make sure that they're um, accurate. OK, so because I'm using Conda, um, which I think is has some equivalence with the VN, uh, we can do Conda list. That'll show me all the packages. Now, I could also, I think in this case, uh, take a look at TCOD, but here we have it, 16.2.13, uh, sorry, 16.2.3, which is uh, considerably higher than 11.15. I think if I do conda list TCOD, I could actually, yeah, it'll just show me that individual package there. And if you're like, okay, well, that's great, but I'm not using, um, I'm not using conda. I think we could probably check that in PIP. Actually, it does say here, you'll notice uh, PYPI. So that's just an indication, or that's typing extensions, but same idea. Uh, we've got the channel here, but um, we also have the option of going into Python. So if we import tcod, tcod oops, double underscore version 16.2.3. So a couple of options in terms of how, um, how we can verify that, but we're good to go there. Uh, like I said, the um, future, the Typing the rough stuff, that's going to be uh, set aside for my own time. I'm not going to spend too much time working on that. And we're going to start with refactoring the previous code. After parts one through five of this tutorial were written, we decided to change a few things around to hopefully make the code base a bit cleaner and uh, easier to extend in the future. Unfortunately, this means that code written in previous parts now has to be excuse me, modified. I would go back and edit the tutorial text and GitHub branches to reflect these changes, except for two excuse me, except for two things. One, I don't have time at the moment. Writing sections that get published every week is taking all of my time as it is. Two, it wouldn't be fair to those who are following the tutorial on a weekly basis. Someday when the event is over, the previous parts will be rewritten and all will be well. But until then, there's several changes that need to be made before proceeding with part six. I won't explain all of the changes. Again, time is a limiting factor, but here are the basic ideas. Event handlers will have the handle events method instead of engine. The game map will have a reference to engine and entities will have a reference to the map. Actions will be initialized when with the ent entity doing the action. And because of the above points, actions will have a reference to engine through entity game map engine. Make the changes to each file. And when you're finished, verify the project works as it did before. So there's quite a bit there. So this is actually, I think probably I had misunderstood a previous comment in terms of the tutorial on the Reddit. So somebody sort of complained about the idea of having to refactor everything partway through. And I actually don't necessarily think that's a terrible thing. So first of all, I think it's always worth remembering. And I maybe feel a little more strongly about this as a as a broadcaster, you know, as particularly a broadcaster of uh, small size, um, you know, people are doing these things as hobbies. Um, I also really like it when people do things that are sort of constructive for others, right? So in terms of my own audience, um, I've played a couple of games where people really talk about being inspired about making games. Um, and I do know there are a few people who develop games who actually still watch the channel, um, but obviously the sort of survival rate of, I've got an idea, I'm really excited to do this, <clears throat> and producing that game, it's not a great rate. It's not terrible. Um, and, you know, not everybody needs to become a professional game developer. There are just simply other things in the world that we really need to get done. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think it's bad. You don't want to discourage people, but you, you also don't want to hold it up as like, this is the way people will respect you or, you know, how you can live a fulfilling life. I think that's something that everybody kind of needs to decide for themselves. But I do think, you know, it is a very challenging um, it's a very challenging thing to do. And I think there can sometimes be a tendency among established figures to sometimes be a little too discouraging. 
Uh, and I think it's because sometimes the uh, question can be poorly posed. So I remember um, there was one that I'd watch. I don't really watch this person anymore, but so they'd ask, what recommendations do you have for uh, becoming a game developer? And it's like, you know, basically says, you're not going to make it if you're asking me uh, this. You know, you're it's it's so easy to do now. You know, if you need if you need uh, me to tell you, uh, you're not going to make it. And I don't even necessarily think that this is wrong, right? Like, I also remember, I'm sorry, this is going to be like the long commentary uh, part, but I, I did want to at least talk a little bit about what I appreciate about this uh, tutorial. I don't necessarily think the person's wrong in saying that because I've also had the experience, um, you know, as a, particularly as an econ TA, um, there's always like that student in the first year. And for some reason, it's always a business student. Um, you know, they come in and they'll say, it's like, you know, what... Um, what do I need to do to get an A in this course? Um, and I, you know, I already have the answer. It's like, you know, come to class on time, engage with the material, study it regularly. And if you have a question, ask the question at the time, don't ask it just before the exam. Uh, and that's not the answer they're looking for, right? What they're looking for is something that they can use to litigate when they get the grade that they're not looking for so that, you know, you can, you know, that that uh, they'll they'll get whatever GPA they need to wind up in some MBA program and leech off of an established business. <laughs> which I'm actually quite, I think most of my friends think I'm a, a closet conservative in terms of my, my financial views, but obviously this makes me feel like I'm I'm ready to, to talk to the revolution. Needless to say, I have complicated views on uh, some of the people who go through um, business programs. I also know some lovely people who went through business programs, but I think even they appreciate the reputation that the business program had in my university. And I'm sure that is not unique to, um, that's not unique to, uh, to, you know, their, uh, to my school. I, I think basically any business uh, faculty is probably going to be like House Slytherin. Haven't read Harry Potter, by the way. I'm too dumb to read books. I just watch the movies, but I've only seen the first four. Doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> so, um, like I said, in terms of that quote unquote advice, um, you know, like, again, I've, I, I know what it's like to be annoyed on a broadcast. I think this individual gets those types of questions very often, but I do kind of need to think like I have had the rather unfortunate circumstance. Now it's not somebody really directly related to something that I, um, I've, I've enjoyed. Um, but I'd say I'd say that somebody who is at least attached to a particular game that I really, um, you know, I really really love, probably one that's been very central to my experience of gaming. Um, there was something that I had done, and there was a bit of a pile on, and this person was a participant in that pile on. And I will confess, I like I I'm an adult, I can get over it. But it's not the best feeling in the world when someone who has even this um, sort of marginal attachment to something that you really enjoy uh, is, is basically talking about how much you suck, particularly when, you know, they don't know me. And so far as I could tell, uh, this thing that was being sort of pointed at and ridiculed is quite different from what I had intended. And again, anybody who has been online, has probably had to suffer something like this. I am not special in that regard, but obviously it's not a great feeling. And the fact that it's sort of attached to something that you enjoy, um, it does it does sometimes dampen it a little bit. So I'm conscious of those two poles, which is to say that, you know, you do want to give good advice and you do want to, uh, you do want to try and be honest with people. Um, or, you know, you sometimes in certain cases will want to develop mechanisms to stop the, you know, the parade of, you know, of boredom or, or frustration that comes towards you, um, because that can, that can also be something that sort of drives away the type of experience that you're looking, uh, looking for as well. Um, but, um, you know, there, there is some value also in taking a moment and thinking a bit about, you know who who you're talking to and what 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 might be motivating that particular question. And I'm not entirely sure in a Twitch chat somebody asking you know how do you get started in terms of gaming. Uh, I'm I'm not entirely sure that you are able to fully parse out where that's coming from. Although again, I would say probably on the balance of probabilities, it's not necessarily somebody who's done um, some initial homework. But there there have been cases where I've seen people answer that question much better. So. 
understanding that there's a very broad perspective, or there's a broad range of responses that people can get, um, and that this can sometimes be a rather fragile uh, aspiration that people have. I like when there are tutorials and I like when there are things that people make the effort to say, hey, you know, you've now built something, right? So in this case here with the roguelike tutorial, again, I'm never, never going to take something like this and try and sell it on Steam. But I think there's definitely something to be said for saying it's like, oh, say, okay, so, you know, we've gone from, um, you know, a little at sign at, on the screen and being able to move that around uh, to something I actually feel kind of excited to, uh, to adjust the level with. And then you can start getting to those really specific areas like, you know, I think everybody who does roguelike things probably gets really into um, procedural generation. That might actually be a trap. Um, but, you know, if you really do get into procedural generation, you know, how do you come up with measures that you're doing better or worse? How do you stop from spending all of your time on that? Because that's really fun for a programmer rather than fun for a player in a lot of cases. Um, and uh, I think you know, being able to have that moment where sort of you've taken that step and you've said, okay, all the hard stuff, right? All that stuff that seemed to be impossible, that first image on the screen now actually has very clearly defined boundaries. And now I want to do something bigger. I don't necessarily think it's all that difficult to imagine somebody going from something like this to saying it's like, okay, so, you know, instead of importing TCOD, I'm going to need to try and tackle this big, scary, uh, you know, API for unity but i know that i can do something like this because we did it with the tutorial so all of this was a really long setup to say is that i really appreciate stuff like this and i i always a little um i'm always a little uncomfortable when i see people sort of complaining it's like oh you know why you know we have to refactor everything and you know you could even imagine somebody saying it's like it's been so long you know why haven't they done the update it's like well this is somebody doing this for their own enjoyment, right? Or somebody, you know, giving back to the community or whatever. They don't owe you anything. Um, so is this a drag? Probably. Um, but on the other hand, this is also a chance to learn, right? I don't think most code, certainly my code, but I'm not a good example for this, does not come out perfectly the first time. Uh, and I think that there is some value in taking the time to set it right right, where you can at least. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you'll you'll have imperfect, uh, you'll have imperfect programs and it's not worth it to move around. And I realize some people will have huge problems with that statement, but you know, um, you, you can't polish every last item uh, and still hope to, still hope to release. And in this case here, because this is learning, I actually think that this is one of the better environments in which to actually make some of those tougher decisions or to do some of that unpleasant work so that maybe you can develop some good instincts for a uh, future one, assuming that you like the structure of this program. Obviously, it might be something that you you say otherwise. So maybe I've just spent 15 minutes talking about this to avoid the, um, you know, avoid the, how do I put it? The, you know, the misery of, of uh, writing and rewriting everything. Um, the only thing that will be a little bit of a challenge for me is that I do tend to like explanations for things. So we'll see if we can, uh, if we can make some sense of what's going on, but I think the time has come for us to roll up our sleeves and do the work in input handlers. This one I think is probably going to involve a little more silent coding than I would normally like, but I think let's um, let's try and make sense of things when, when it makes sense, I guess. Um, you know, in some cases I may just be able to say, I know I need to do this thing and, you know, maybe one day I'll, I'll learn why. So I'll talk a little bit about, we mentioned before uh, the future import. So from future port annotations. <clears throat> so getting rid of, uh, well, we're not really getting rid of optional, but we're adding type checking. Now I mentioned before that I, I don't believe type checking has ever, um, has ever been absent when we import annotations. I think that's probably just a thing. Um, so in here, if we're type checking, so we've also got returns true when the argument X is true. Otherwise, the built-ins true and false are the only two instances of, the, of class bool. Oh, no, sorry. This is talking about bool, not um, type checking. So does it tell us here full name? Huh. Hmm. 
Okay. So again, I'm assuming that these two editions are basically dealing with the type hinting in terms of um, in terms of uh, this particular project. This is something that's definitely one I'm I'm not all that comfortable with in terms of Python, but this is a chance for me to learn. So we've got our event handler. Now it looks like we didn't actually have an init here. So uh, def init self engine engine engine. I'm not that familiar with it, but I think C Sharp actually has a few things that are designed to sort of stop doing a lot of this repetitive stuff. I would have to imagine that if that's done um, in C Sharp, that there would be an equivalent that people have developed for their own pet languages. But I don't know them, and I don't think it's that critical for us to know uh, right now now, but that might be good for me to take a look and see if I can avoid the sort of self every argument in an init statement. Events, oops. So I think this is just moving the, um, I actually think this is just the old Oh God, what were they taking that from again? So I think we wrote this a little bit differently. I don't think I should go too far off off script here, um, but I feel that there were a couple. I feel like there were a couple of cases where we're duplicating. Well, obviously we're duplicating work because that's um, we're moving things around. But I think I might have written a couple of things differently. Okay, so Evie quits the same key down, needs a change. What I think I'll do is I'll just try and find, okay, well, we know this was, um, this was different. Um, so we need a player. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that seems to be it for input handlers. I think this was maybe the part that I was freaking out a bit about. And what I'll do is I'll commit the refactoring first, and then we'll um, we'll commit the um, the the substance of part six. Okay, on to actions. We'll try and get some real estate back. So. We already have type checking, but it wants optional and tuple, right? Because those would be imports from the other other part. Okay, so again, we need to do an init. Okay, so we need a property here. Okay. 
Okay, perform the action with objects needed to determine its scope. Okay, so some adjustments here. So we need to say self engine and presumably self entity. But uh, that doesn't change because this was just, um, this needs to be implemented by the lower ones. This is incidentally, so I, this is probably me being stupid saying this, but there is a side of me that wants to say, it's like, oh, I wonder if this is one of these examples, just because I see these like not implemented and and sort of these, um, how do I put it? Um, these uh, almost like interfaces. I'm wondering if this would be a point where I would sit down and say, oh, this is a case where we want to do abstract based classes. Um, the thing is, is that I get the impression that probably for a project like this, this might be uh, a, a bit of overkill. Um, I kind of have only ever really seen those in, um, you know, the sorts of the sorts of things that become like libraries. Um, but this is again one of these examples where, when I, excuse me, go and do this on my own, or if I want to try and do some improvements or try and maybe reinforce some of my understanding. This would be an example where I would want to sit down and maybe with a piece of paper uh, write out, okay, why would why would this be a good solution or why would this be a bad solution and actually try and work that out for my uh, myself. It's not the sort of thing that I would want to dedicate a large part of a video towards because in the end it might just be, you know, I learned that that was a very silly idea. Um, but it's one of these cases where, okay, I know this sort of thing exists and it, at least on the surface level, it seems to be trying to solve a problem that this other thing here is trying to do. And so um, where I can, you know, I try to turn that into an opportunity to say, it's like, okay, does this demonstrate that I understand this concept well? Um, is this an example where, yes, the project would have been improved by this? Or, you know, did I, did I learn a fancy new idea and I'm trying to sort of fit it in in certain ways? Obviously, the last place, last thing you want to do is just do something because it makes you look clever, uh, often because you don't look clever when you do stuff like that. But um, on the other hand, if you're, it's actually a little bit like semicolons with me. When I was in um, English class in middle school, there was a teacher who was really insistent that like, if you use a semicolon appropriately, you just seem like the smartest, you know, son of a gun um, on the, that ever walked the planet. But if you misuse a semicolon, you just look like a complete fool and you should, you should avoid using semicolons unless you're really, really sure. And I am never sure about anything. So I largely avoid semicolons, despite the fact that I very often talk in a way that would make that natural to, to use. Um, and so, uh, yeah, to this day, I, I, don't, I don't even use semicolons in C++. No. <laughs> but, uh, the, um, but no, the, uh, this is sort of one of these examples um, where I actually still, th I think that is reasonably good advice, right? You don't do... It's like using a you know a complicated word when a simple one will suffice, right? All that you really do is actually a really good. Let me see if I can find this um, line. I'm sorry, I know I'm getting I'm getting on a lot of uh, a lot of digressions here, but this is uh, this is how I make refactoring fun. Um, Yes, this actually spit uh, this this works well for two entries in Fowler's Dictionary of Modern English Usage. So, uh, didacticism: the speaker who has discovered that Juan and Quixote are not uh, not pronounced in Spain as he used to pronounce them as a boy is not content to keep so important a piece of information to himself. He must have the rest of us call them Juan and Quixote. And at any rate, uh, he will give us the chance of mending our ignorant ways by doing so. Um, but the one that I think is more appropriate here, uh, both with um, abstract based classes and the uh, tendency to, to overuse certain types of words. I used to work with a guy who loved throwing around obsequious as soon as he learned it. Didn't know any other um, $5 words, but used obsequious in every single case that he could. Uh, although this one, I guess, 
I don't think is a French word, but uh, French words. Display of superior knowledge is as great a vulgarity as a display of superior wealth. Greater indeed, inasmuch as knowledge should tend more definitely than wealth towards discretion and good manners. So I happen to think it's nice when a usage dictionary is witty, but this is uh, this is why I'm very timid when it comes to um, I, I do like looking for cases where I can use uh, new things because I think it reinforces certain concepts well. But uh, you also want to be careful that you don't... Um... Oh, hang on. Okay, that's fine. Action with direction. We're putting in an entity. Right, so, and then we have an action here and we're implementing, or well, we're... Okay, this is where I need to focus. So action with direction, we are, we added the entity. We're getting, right, we're initializing from the action and we're giving it a DX and DY because this is action with a direction. And now we are defining a new property for action with direction. I don't think I don't think the um, apostrophes being absent are actually a mistake. I think there's a a pretty it's a pretty consistent. Um, pattern here that they they don't put the apostrophes i don't know why um because you know in the case of python you can do this you can also do this um <clears throat> but uh, in this case you know again i i'll i make i'm taking the step to add what i think makes sense where i can uh, and if it breaks something that gives me an opportunity to learn so of entity x plus the change. It is worth maybe mentioning, I don't know if I talked about it at the time. Okay, so it doesn't like the self here. doesn't like the uh, <laughs> doesn't like the implied variable from a misspelling of return. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the time, but one thing that's of course nice about the DX is that you can imagine when we sit down and write this, uh, maybe they even mentioned this in the tutorial, but it would just make sense to do one, right? It's like, well, you know, it's our game. We're gonna make it, um, we're gonna make it so that you have, um, you know, you move in one direction and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, if there's a potion of speed or if there's, you know, something that you want to do to change this, you don't need to make any further changes to action with direction. You just, you know, you could define the constant somewhere else. So um, in this case here, it's a little, I always like to think that this is the case where your um, algebra teacher comes comes back when you say, when are we ever going to use this? It's like, well, dealing with with variables is nicer. Okay, blocking T. Oh, for heaven's sake! I don't. I'm defining something. I don't know why I think I can tab it. Okay, it doesn't have to be anything, but if it is, it has to be an entity. So I think this is just getting the thing, or it's well, return the blocking entity at this action's destination. That's exactly what that's doing. So this one's interesting. I don't use this very often, but I think what the little star here is doing, it's like a, I think they call this the splat operator, but essentially what it does is that dest x, y, I believe provides uh, more than one. Um, so 
the idea here is that this just sort of unpacks the result that you uh, that you get. It might actually be kind of nice to see. Um, Oh yeah, no, of course, it's a dx and dy. Um, so where's the dest part though? <laughs> right here. <laughs> right, yeah, so it's ta uh, taking a tuple. So uh, get blocking entity at location. Um, do I have that? Yeah, it takes the x and the y. So I suppose in this case, you need to be sure that the tuple is actually producing the um, the right order that you have. But yeah, I think that's what this is doing here, is this is unpacking that tuple and providing it as two arguments to uh, get blocking entity at location. Uh, okay, def perform. Um, we are taking self to none, right? Because we don't have an engine and an entity anymore. And we're still raising the not implemented error. Interesting. We're not doing right because there's subclasses. There's the melee action and the movement action. That's why it's not implemented. Okay. Um, so for action with direction, apparently, right where this is this. Okay. So I actually kind of like the order in which this has been brought in. So we are essentially just saying, okay, performing the melee action. Um, we assign a target. We get rid of all of this performance. Um, all of this performance implementation inside. So I guess, I mean, this is probably not very enlightening, but I guess you could summarize all of these changes basically, you know, what lives what lives better with, or kind of put, putting things in the right houses, basically. Um, one thing I will confess, I always feel a little weird whenever I see stuff like this. So self engine game map, get blocking entity at location. Like it's, it's hard to say that this doesn't make sense, right? Because where are you going to find a blocking entity at a location? Well, you're going to find that in a game map, but it's sort of like when you're going in, it's like, okay, so what are we working with here? Well, we're working with, um, self. So what is this self? Well, this is an action with a direction. So the action with uh, a direction is an action, and the action has an entity. That's just, to me, at least a little bit more. It's not the most intuitive. The game map thing, absolutely. But there's obviously a little bit where I'm like, okay, so what has the engine inside of it? Oh, the entity has an engine inside of it. Wait, does it make sense that there are engine uh, entities with... Um, Engines. Oh, actually, I didn't even know that uh, engines were in the game map. I probably should have. Wait, no, hang on. This doesn't make any sense. Return self entity game map engine. Okay, so engines live in game maps. But for some reason, we're taking an engine and unpacking a game map from it. I'm going to trust the code, um, but yeah, this is, this is, <laughs> this is confusing a little bit. Um, and again, it's where I just try and follow the logic in terms of what's going on. Like this idea of saying is like, okay, we take a game map, we we get a blocking entity. It's like, okay, yes, we're, we're digging in deeper in a few different steps. But in the end, it seems to me that if you, if someone were to say, it's like, well, why'd you put this this way? It's like, well, where else are you going to find stuff on maps, right? Like we, we want to find a destination. We're going to go for dinner. You know, we take out a map, even if it's on a phone, point to that thing and saying, we're going here. Um, if it comes to, um, you know, again, this idea of engines and game maps, maybe because there isn't a real world um, comparison to it, but that was, you could sort of just see that process, right? Where I'm sort of like, okay, this makes sense. And then I'm trying to justify the existence of like engines and game maps together. That's definitely going to be something that I, I do on my own time, just because I know I'm really struggling with the runtime on this. Um, we haven't even done the refactoring yet. But um, we'll press on and I'm just kind of making the notes for myself to uh, keep track of future 
questions. Okay, self to none, not implemented error. So we are moving on to the melee action, one of the types that we can do. So action with direction, self to none, set the blocking entity. Did I? Oh, right, right, right. No, we did that as well. So movement action now. Uh, again, we're doing a similar cleanup. So performing the action is just changing the self. Um, and I think this is just du tuple unpacking. So I think this is basically like, um, it's kind of like that splat, except that you don't need to do the splat if you're assigning variables. Okay, so now we need to add self dot engine game map inbounds, but the rest of this should make sense. The one thing that's kind of nice about this is just because of the way the diff works, it seems like this is a lot more work than it is. But obviously for me, part of this is also being able to understand why some of these things work. So obviously the self here actually carries some implications I haven't been able to work out for myself yet. Okay, bump action. Again, we get rid of the engine and entity. We've sort of repeated that a few times over. Um, if self blocking entity. I guess we just take the, you know what, let's not get lazy. So turn melee action self entity self nope dx okay so we don't need anything but the else at this point and then we take the entity and we just perform it. And I remember to add a comma. Okay, so that's actions taken care of. Now to game map. I think this is gonna be where I start getting weirded out. Where did game map go? There we go. Um, this is maybe going to be where I hopefully start getting a bit of an idea in terms of the engine and entity business. So we already have annotations, iterable option type checking. Uh, we need to import engine. Okay, so we're changing the parameters for init. It's also getting long, so we put it on a new line. So uh, self, we start with an engine. Still have width, still have height, um, still have entities. Oops. So we just define the engine here. And then visible will be, we're still doing full, we're still taking width and height. Oh, this looks like this is just clean up to stop it from being a big long entry. So a tuple fill value order, tuple fill value order. Yep. No, we don't need to go crazy. <laughs> All right. I suppose that makes sense too, because um, if we add the engine, does the engine tell us anything that we that we needed for this? And it's like, well, we've already given it a default fill value. We've already got our width and height. So unless the engine somehow contained the width and height information, I shouldn't have expected anything in there as well. But obviously I only found that out after the fact. Okay, uh, self location X, location Y. Again, I think this is just another cleanup job. Um, Okay. 
And then, yeah, we're adding parentheses around these. Oops. I'm a little too used to, um, a little too used to my notebooks. Um, okay, so I guess this makes sense too. It's a different uh, different condition on each line, so it's a little bit easier to just sort of see the logic here. Okay, and we have render. So signature is the same. Is the convention to put a space between these? I'll do it. It just feels a little funny. Okay. Um, so we've got console tiles. We've got a space between these. So that makes sense that it gets its own line. Oh, they added a comma at the end. I don't really think that's necessary, but I'll, again, I'll follow the tutorial. We're already making all of these refactoring changes. So, okay, main. Uh, we get rid of event handler. Um, we add the deep. Surely this is just. This is just removing. Yeah, a little too aggressive there, but fair enough. Um, Okay. These are all definitely simpler, so I definitely see the the logic behind that. Um, option game map equals, of course, there's the the price to pay. This still needs to go somewhere, so we're putting generate dungeon. Uh, actually, you know what? We can make this easier. I think the indentation remains the same. Yeah. Okay. And then we need to... Yeah, this is the thing that still weirds me out. I, I still don't quite have the... Like, I understand it's got to happen, but it's very funny to see the engine... Like, to see it reference itself. I get that you can do it, for sure. It's just weird. <laughs> Um, update field of view. Okay, so we get rid of the old engine. Uh, TCOD, new terminal. We need to change the engine. Actually, we just get rid of all of that. So, so while true, let me make sure I'm not. Okay, we don't get rid of the renderer. So, engine event handler, handle events. Okay, that was fairly simple. Uh, back to, or well, it's the first time we're opening it for today. Um, so we're adding optional to typing. Okay, so an entity needs a game map now. Well, it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't need one. It can have one. And if this entity has a game map,
Right. I think I kind of understand where this is coming from. Okay, yes, and now we add something so that we can actually put somebody on the game map, I think. Yeah, place a entity at a new location. So def place self an x coordinate, y coordinate, game map. But presumably, if the game map is none, then it just doesn't do anything. Well, let's see what it does. So, place this entity at a new location. Handles moving across game maps. Curious what they mean moving across game maps. So that could mean movement, or that could mean um, that could mean sort of preserving locations between levels. Okay, self x equals x, self y equals y. Uh, remembering in this case, what is the self referring to? The self is referring to an entity. Okay, hang on. So we've got placement and we have spawning. Huh. No, no, no. Okay, I get this. I get this. So you hit a, um, you run into an orc, you hit an orc, you do damage to it, you run downstairs, and haha, you know, the developer didn't bother to put any kind of persistence into the enemies in here, so I never have to worry about that orc again. Nope, too bad. The orc is chasing you down the stairs, and we don't want to spawn a new orc because um, it took some damage, and so we want to retain that information. That's, I think, what this is trying to do. If game map, if has attribute self game map, nope. Remove them from the... Yes, okay, so remove me from the old game map, add me to the game map, that's the argument here. Um... I'm sure this was perfectly obvious to most people, but again, this is a chance for me to learn. I don't know if this is... All, well, I don't know if any of these are that exciting, actually, but... Um, it's not... Let's face it, this is not a barn burner in terms of uh, an activity to be, uh, to be doing, but I feel I'm starting to get at least a little bit... Um, a little bit of progress on the logic. Uh, behind this. Okay, so type checking, we're adding engine. And sorry, this is proc gen, so right, because our maps are going to have engines. So generate dungeon. Oh, hell, where'd you go? All right, so after monsters per room. Well, actually, we can just replace player entity here. Okay, still produces a game map. Well, that's interesting. I didn't put the comment. Okay, so we needed to, we don't 
pass the player as an argument, we need to pull that out of the engine. Dungeon um, game map. Well, actually, we can just modify this one. So, right, because game maps now contain engines, we need to include that. Uh, we have a map width, map height, map height, and entities, so we're good to go there. Uh, now, if length rooms is zero, place the first room where the player starts, but we need to get the player out of... Oh, right, we're placing the player. Of course, that's the splat. Uh, again, we know we're getting an X and Y off of it. Um, everything else stays the same there. All right, engine. So we need to put in annotations. Typing import. Now oh, that's interesting. Oh, probably just because the uh, iterable and any are going to be covered by what we cover in type checking. So we don't bring in entities and game maps. At least at the top here, we bring them in conditional on type checking. Okay, so change the init so that it's just a player now. So the event handler. Um, So this, I suspect, we need to write still. Um, <clears throat> getting rid of the game map. We don't need to update the field of view. OK. Handle enemy turns is the same. Handle events is completely gone. Update field of view stays the same. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so let's just take a second here. So we've got an engine. We initialize an engine with uh, itself player entity. So the self event handler is an event handler which comes from input handlers. It inherits from event dispatch. We initialize it with an engine. Right, okay, nope, this makes sense. I hope it makes sense at least. So it's saying that we have completed the refactoring. What I wanna do here before I commit any of this, we should have saved all of the different items. I do actually wanna run this. So, all right, didn't like something. So let's deal with these one at a time. So we've got input handlers.py on line 21. Doesn't like the idea of continuing. So continues not properly in a loop. That makes sense. I probably have a tab problem here, but let's just make sure I'm not Okay, that's exactly what that is. So the reason why I want to double check this, right, is that I'm going to want to do this for all of these. All right, doesn't like generate dungeon. Um, got an unexpected keyword argument player. So that's in main.py. 
So this one's probably pretty simple. It's just a question of me, yep, probably forgetting to delete that one line. I think I was originally going to overwrite it and I didn't. Let's just make sure that that's, yep. Okay, that's encouraging. So um, because we have the processing text still inside here, uh, we did successfully kick the orc, much to its annoyance. And because it is fun to run around the environment here, maybe try a couple cases where I run into the sides of walls. I don't think I'm going to run into a situation where I can try and walk off the map. Sorry, I realize this is probably more fun for me than the people who are <laughs> watching, but... Everything worked. I guess the one drawback with me spending so much time in this is that if there were some kind of uh, error that didn't like completely take the whole thing down, I wouldn't have... Excuse me. I wouldn't see it, but... This seems like a good place to do a commit. Now, probably if this was my project saying refactoring from part six is not really a good commit message, but we did spend about 40, I guess I spent a lot of time talking. So 45 minutes to half an hour on uh, refactoring this. I want to move on to part six. So this last part of the tutorial, uh, sorry, the last part of the tutorial set us up for combat. So it's now time to actually implement it. In order to make killable entities, rather than attaching hit points to each entity we create, we'll create a component called fighter, which will hold information related to combat like HP, max HP, attack, and defense. If an entity can fight, it will have this component attached to it, and if not, it won't. This way of doing things is called composition, and it's an alternative to your typical inheritance-based programming model. This tutorial used both composition and inheritance. Create a new Python package, a folder with an empty init.py file called components. In that directory, add two new files, one called basecomponent.py, and another called fighter.py. The fighter class in fighter.py will inherit from the class we put in base component.py. So let's start with that one. Okay, so there's a few steps that we need to take here. So first of all, we're making a new, um, hang on. So I think we add a folder. It's actually been a while since I've had to do this. So uh, components. It does say empty in it. Okay. <clears throat> so our friend future. To remember what property does again. Um, doesn't say here. Hmm. 
Mm, it would be so wonderful if we lived in a world that did not have search engine optimized websites that just quoted back the manual. This probably is a little too little too much for me, but let's see. Okay, calling property is a succinct way of building a data descriptor that triggers a function call upon access to an attribute. Helps whenever user interface is granted attribute access and then subsequent changes require the intervention of method. For instance, a spreadsheet class may grant access to a cell value through cell B10 um, dot value. Subsequent improvements to uh, the program require the cell to be recalculated on every access. However, the prog programmer does not want to affect existing client code accessing the attribute directly. The solution is to wrap access uh, to the value attribute in a property data descriptor. Okay, so we have uh, value property, and then we, that's, I, I don't think I'd pass a quiz on this, but I think I have a general idea again. I know we looked this up before, but self to engine. With that, let's now open up fighter.py and put the following into it. I think this is kind of interesting that I'm specifying that I'm pulling from components when I'm already inside. Hmm. Again, I don't do this very often, so... Um... I wonder what power is. Maybe some kind of mana or something? No, it, probably the uh, attack value. That's interesting that they're underscoring. So I think normally you put an underscore like this when you don't want people to access it. I think there's a convention that says you don't mess with the underscore stuff. I guess that would be because you don't want to... You simply don't want to be messing with the um, the actual HP value. You want to do that through um, you want to do that through the proper channels, basically. But I'm sure it will explain. It is so weird to spell this with an S. I think this is just returning the health. Then presumably there's a behavior that's set um, presumably there's a value that when you hit an HP of zero, you do something, but they don't want to do that in the fighter component, at least for now. Uh, we import and inherit from base component, which gives us access to the parent entity and the engine, which will be useful later on. The init function takes a few arguments. HP represents the entity's hit points. Defense is how much damage... Uh, Sorry, how much taken damage will be reduced? Power is the entity's raw attack power. What What's with the HP property? We define both a getter and a setter, which will allow us access to HP like a normal variable. The getter, the one with the property thing above the method, doesn't do anything special. It just returns the HP. The setter, uh, at HP setter, is where things get more interesting. By defining HP this way, we can modify the value as it's set within the method. This line, self underscore HP equals max zero min value self max HP, means that HP, which we access through HP, will never be set to less than zero and also won't ever go higher than the max HP attribute. 
So that's our fighter component. It won't do us much good at the moment because the entities in our game still don't move or do much of anything, besides the player anyway. To give some life to our entities, we can add another component, which, when attached to our entities, will allow them to take turns and move around. So this is also maybe worth mentioning here, this idea of adding components to um, the entities. We're really getting close to something like uh, Unity here, right? So Unity, I think, did a really smart, uh, um, like a, I guess, a co-branding or, or whatever it was with Lego. Because if you think of it, like when you, if you go into Unity, so um, the program will have uh, its own things, right? So there's always going to be a transform attached to any object, um, but maybe you want it to be emitting sounds. Well, what you can do is you can add a component and there's all sorts of little sound uh, sound making components that you can uh, attach it to. You don't necessarily need to write that for yourself. But chances are, if you want to make a game that people want to play, you are going to actually have to make something that uh, the people at Unity Technologies have not already developed for you. But even then, what you do is you will write a script, usually in C Sharp. I think in previous versions there had been a couple of other alternatives, but I think C Sharp is just kind of the, the thing uh, that's used now. And um, essentially what you'll do is you'll say, okay, you know, this is the, you know, I don't know the whatever behavior I'm looking for. Sorry, I can't, I don't really have a clear example in my head right now because I'm, I'm trying to think, I guess I'd maybe talk about the fighter component in this case here. Um, but what's nice about this, right, is that, you know, to a certain extent, if you're somebody who doesn't like coding, this can be actually quite, um, this can be quite unnerving. So I, you know, I'm not necessarily a very good programmer, but I, um, I do enjoy it and I do, do like thinking about it. So to me, this is kind of the fun, right? You know, I sit down and I say, okay, excuse me. How am I going to represent this thing, right? You know, I think one of the things that's fun about this is this is kind of the case where you say that, you know, well, knives are really just, you know, short range guns with infinite ammo, right? Um, you know, like clearly no, um, but in programming land, that's actually a very helpful way of thinking of them in some cases. So, um, you know, what you do is you, you build this little component and you, you add it in. And again, it's this idea of, you know, you have your, your Lego piece and you add another, you know, you add another, so you have your Lego structure, you add another piece onto it and that adds um, some capability to it. So one of the things that is uh, tricky for me, and this is where, again, this is very meta, this doesn't necessarily directly relate to the creation of games. But one of the things that is interesting to me is that obviously, you know, Unity is a very popular tool, but it isn't the only tool. So Unity had its origin in a game developer, which had developed a whole bunch of tooling to make its game. And they didn't have a lot of success with the game, but they did find that, um, you know, the tools that they had developed was something that uh, they thought was worth selling. And they happened to do that at the time that the Apple App Store, I think it was out for a little bit longer before that, but basically the Apple App Store opening up to game developers and the fact that they sort of had this idea of something that could deploy to lots of different platforms was something that, you know, right place, right time. It really wound up being something that people found useful for developing mobile games. And of course, mobile games are absolutely massive. Um, <clears throat> so... The thing is, is that if you think about something like Unity, clearly that engine has moved beyond its its origins, but its origins still are, you know, we wanted to make this specific kind of game and, you know, this game that we made didn't really work out. Um, so what we're going to focus now on is taking these very helpful tools that we made and try to extend them in a way that other people can wind up developing games. But in the end, there are going to be a certain set of assumptions in terms of the right way to do things um, that are built into Unity. And I imagine that if you use something like Unreal, um, there are going to be very familiar ideas and uh, or you can use some of the, you know, some of the ones that are not the big headline ones. So there's lots of sort of free and open source um, engines. But there is always that question to me that um, is this idea of adding components to entities in um, 
is this just a way that people very commonly think of games, maybe even just software in general? Uh, or is this sort of a something that we've sort of inherited from one certain way of thinking about developing games? And I mean, one way that we could presumably look at this, there are some of the older games, um, they do have source code release. So you, you can look at sort of Dooms and uh, I think Rogue has its, um, its source open. There's lots of open source games from a time when these weren't necessarily standard conventions. And I imagine if you if you have a certain temperament, I probably don't. Um, but it may be helpful to take a look at that and see, was there another way of doing it? Or is this whole idea of adding components, you know, is this just the way you think about games? It seems to be a very helpful one, right? Like this tutorial is using it, Unity uses this. And uh, again, there is something to be said, whether the pipeline goes Unity to this or this to Unity, you have, um, you know, you have familiar, uh, familiar ideas. And then presumably, if there's a common language that people use inside of an industry, understanding that language, understanding those conventions is probably a good way to, to be employable. Although, hopefully, people hire talent and uh, understand that, you know, learning the lingo is part of the part of the job. Okay. Um, that's our fighter component. It won't do this right. So we are going to, oh no. So it does want us to add movement. That's interesting. Actually, I guess the first place I would have gone would have been to try and do the combat to the static enemies. I wouldn't have necessarily gone directly to AI, but interesting. Uh, let's go, okay, create a file in components called ai.py. And a little bit like Unity, it looks like we're importing TCOD to handle the heavy lifting. We do not need to develop our own AI. At least this is why I'm, I'm assuming this is why we're adding in TCOD. I could be wrong. Okay, so we don't have a general AI. Um, okay, so our AI has said, I wanna go over here, find me a way to do that. This is almost certainly where TCOD's going to help us to do something because I know there's a whole bunch of fancy thinking that's gone into the best way to solve this. Compute and return a path to the target position. There is no valid path, then returns an empty list. It's interesting that it doesn't know that I'm working with a string. Okay, this makes sense. So this is back, remember when I was, um, so I was working with the game map, it's like, okay, so we've got the tiles, we're going to take that layer of tiles that says walkable. Um, turning it into numbers. So this would just be trues and falses right now. Um, presumably we could change it to, hmm. I'm wondering if different floor types are something that we could add without too much trouble, just based on the fact that this changing these to numbers. Okay, for entity in self entity game map entities.
Okay, so add to the cost of a block position. I think in this case, it's just saying you have to go around uh, something to calculate the proper cost. Lower number means more NM. So here it looks like we're actually already defining, I think I've misunderstood what these things are doing, but um, based on that description, it looks like we have one of our first um, sort of decisions here. So this number 10, um, it sort of told us we have, um, we have some different options in terms of how we can affect the behavior. Okay, so... Um, Create a graph from the cost array. What's that graph to a new pathfinder? So cost is a NumPy array where each node has the cost for movement into that node. Zero or negative values are used to mark blocked areas. A reference uh, of this array is used. Any changes to the array will be reflected in the graph. So right now, I think we just have zeros and ones, uh, which is why we talked about walkable, because if walkable is false, walkable translates into a zero. Um, I think we showed that actually in terms of uh, being able to add true and true. But um, yeah, in this case here, presumably if we had other values uh, which were not Booleans, we could say, you know, maybe there's a, a bog, right? And that'll double your, uh, that'll double the cost of movement. And so, you know, if it's a narrow, if it's a narrow part of the bog and that'll allow you to go straight at the, the enemy, you want to still allow for the possibility of running through that. But for most people, it would make sense to sort of run around and try and get to where the player, um, where the player seems to be going. Okay, so we've got a simple graph. Right, so it talked about cost. Um, cardinal uh, and diagonal are cost to move along the edges for those. Oh, that's right. This is an interesting one, actually. So I remember reading up a bunch about hex grids. I was really interested in them. And it's just something, there's just something, I guess it's because of the old um, tabletop war game history, but uh, there's just something about a hex grid that just looks so interesting. Um, and then I sort of learned something about how, you know, there are these very nice properties of hex grids, and this is why it's helpful for doing things with a bunch of different algorithms for how to implement them and why you'd maybe use one or another. There's actually a really helpful uh, website called Red, Red Blob Games, which has a lot on hex grids. It's not comprehensive. They sort of mention a couple of other... Hmm. Excuse me. Interesting approaches which don't um, uh, they don't go into in depth. But I mean, again, there's a certain point. Like the question is, do you want a tutorial re reference to do the thinking for you, or do you want the tutorial reference to point you into interesting places where you can uh, start doing your own work? I definitely think the latter is more interesting. So I guess in this case here because we're dealing with uh, tiles, it's trying to find out what the um, how to resolve this. Because I, I know in some games, I think if you just use default values, moving diagonally just winds up being the fastest movement you can use. And sometimes that's okay. You just accept that that's how that works. Um, but in other cases, I know, I think like XCOM, for instance, um, imposes a penalty. I think it's like a one and a half movement or something like that. Anyways, um, should probably learn a little geometry again and actually work out exactly how how this all goes. Uh, so cardinal and diagonal are the cost to move along the edges for those directions. The total cost to move from one node to another is the cost array value multiplied by the edge cost. Uh, okay. Sorry, got sidetracked. So cardinal is two, diagonal is three. So I think this makes sense. We've got... Um, a, uh, they're establishing a, a ratio between um, the different types of movements. Pathfinder is TCOD path, Pathfinder graph.
Well, that worked that time. <laughs> Not even gonna, all right. Hey, one of my favorites uh, from Python, so. Okay, um, quite a bit there. So um, <clears throat> this kind of comes back to what I was saying in terms of the Unity stuff. Like, um, if we imagine TCOD is Unity, and I know some people will find that insulting, but I don't think Unity is a dirty word. Um, so essentially, this is saying, hey, you know what? There's a lot of very smart people who have thought about pathfinding, right? This is something that if you have ever played a real-time strategy game, uh, this will definitely affect your ability to get stuff done. And, you know, uh, a lot of very good game developers have spent a lot of time thinking about this. And of course, a lot of computer scientists have spent some time thinking about how to uh, how to do this. You can see really interesting visualizations of how these pathfinding algorithms wind up working. So as is the case with software, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And so TCOD provides a bunch of uh, paths. And the fact that it says simple graph, um, I think there's a suggestion here that there might be weird and wonderful tools that you can use to make um, make even better, uh, make even better um, uh, make even better uh, or at least more complicated um, pathing or uh, well I guess in the end this all just comes down to the AI but uh, I think there's a bunch of different things that the idea of simple graph um, I think it implies that there can be even more um, I don't know because I haven't looked yet um, so the main idea here I mean I, I actually kind of like the way of thinking about this just naturally for me it kind of um, make sense. I guess I would maybe say sometimes you can sort of see these maps and you'll sometimes sort of see it's almost like, you know, you're looking at the wind, right? And you're sort of seeing the wind move in certain areas. And that's kind of a representation in terms of it's like, okay, so we had a bunch of stuff that was sort of moving all in this one direction. And here's sort of where where it moved the fastest and the slowest. And you can sort of see if you look at a room Normally, if you just want to go to the kitchen and get a cup of tea, you know, you walk forward to the kitchen. You do not think about this at all. Um, but if you kind of imagine that, you know, you start, you see the matrix and all of a sudden you're seeing all of these different paths to the kitchen and you're picking between all of these different paths and you're picking the one that will minimize the number of steps or whatever. You'll pick that, but then you can imagine, oh, you know, I've got um, a smartwatch on and, you know, it's 1159 and I need to get my last few steps in to maintain my streak. Maybe I'm going to choose the path that, you know, goes a full circuit around the house before I get my cup of tea or something. Like that. Sorry, that's such a stupid example, but um, this is kind of what uh, Graph and Pathfinder are doing, right? And in this case here, we want to come up with the shortest path. Presumably, I mean, actually, I should maybe be a little more careful about this um, because there is actually a parameter that we have, um, which uh, I guess technically is not a parameter, but there is a value that we have here, which is determining that. And as it says, the lower number means enemies will crowd and a higher number means enemy will take longer paths to surround the player. Um, and you can see how um, you kind of see how this works. Um, because you're taking, um, you have your entity. Um, so if an entity blocks movement and you take the position, sorry, let me just make sure. Yeah, okay, no, sorry. You've got the cost of the, uh, the location and you're saying, okay, so we've got this location, I'm gonna add 10 but you can add a smaller value or a higher value. And again, what you're doing is you're altering this spot so that when it goes into this graph, it's um, it's altering the behavior. Um, I don't think I explained that any better than just looking at the code does, but... Um, Right, and sorry, I was going to say the uh, this is, I think, the first example of a list comprehension. I love these things in Python. So essentially, you can say, okay, we've got a path. Right now, the problem is we want to have, right, we, we have a list, and then each list is itself a list of integers. So, um, and that's because we've converted the result from Pathfinder path two. If we look at the ID, it should tell us, right, returns an ND array. 
So we are taking this slice from that array, turning that into a list. But we want to convert this into something that we can work with. So specifically, we want a set of tuples. And so we have path. Index, um, this is a bit of a tricky one, but essentially what this is, is we're taking, imagine path as, again, we've got this list, specifically a list of ends. And so inside of that, we've got uh, position one and position two. So we're saying, okay, for each item, which we're calling index in path, unpack that item, get me item number one, item number two, in this case, the index value of zero and one, and put those into a tuple. And then um, you could, if you wanted, build a list this way, but this is just a nice little compact way of saying it's like, this is the thing that I'm producing, right? The list of tuples, iterate over that list and go in. So one example of this would be, let's say you have a generator and you wanted to know what that generator provides. The generator is just an instruction manual for how to create this um, iterable. So one thing you could do is you could actually just say for X in your generator, although hopefully you'd have a more descriptive name than X, um, put that in a list and then you'll get your list. Now, hopefully it's not you know a generator that runs forever because in some cases that makes sense to do that. But for simple cases where you just wanna see if it works, that's a handy little way that you can just sort of see the results, assuming it's not too big. Obviously there are some very sensible situations where you would never want to turn that into a list. Okay, base I am doesn't imp uh, implement a perform method since entities uh, which will be using AI to act will have uh, have to have an AI class that inherits from this one. Get path two uses the walkable tiles on our map along with some TCOD pathfinding tools to get the path from base I AI's parent entity to whatever their target might be. In the case of this tutorial, the target will always be the player, though you could theoretically write a monster that cares more about food or treasure than attacking the player. I like that they include this as well, right? Because that's where you start thinking, okay, how would we alter this to produce um, a certain type of, of behavior? The Pathfinder first builds an array of cost, which is how costly, time-consuming, it will take to get, uh, to get to the target. If a piece of terrain takes longer to traverse, its cost will be higher. In the case of our simple game, all the parts of the map have the same cost, but what this cost array allows us to do is to take other entities into account. How? Well, if an entity exists on a spot on the map, we increase the cost of moving here to 10. What this does is encourages the entity to move around the entity that's blocking them from their target. Higher values will cause the entity to take a longer path around. Shorter values will cause groups to gather into crowds since they don't want to move around. More information about TCOD's pathfinding can be find, found here, and this is on Read the Docs. So I actually really, I definitely prefer their description here. So this is one thing that you could imagine. Let's say that over the course of developing this game, we decide that trolls and orcs have different speeds. Maybe we'll add a third one, right? So we've got goblins, orcs, and trolls. And you could say that um, because trolls move very slowly and because goblins move very quickly, and, you know, the idea would maybe be that goblins sort of swarm a player, whereas trolls are just sort of this lumbering threat that sort of moves towards the player. You can see some situations where you would not necessarily want to have a big string of goblins running down one single hallway because effectively all that you do is you keep them at the chokehold and you just bat them away one at a time. Um, and so you could imagine a situation where you'd say, it's like, okay, if I'm stuck behind a troll, like, I, I don't want that to happen. That is a disaster. And so you could say, okay, trolls have these, like, massive um, cost values to them. Whereas a little goblin is like, well, you know, these little goblins can move very fast, so it's probably not going to be in my, my way very quickly. And you maybe even want to say, it's like, okay, if I'm a goblin and I'm blocked, maybe I care about being blocked more than other ones. Obviously, I'm adding tons of complexity here, which may not make the game more interesting. But you can sort of see, right, how if you add something like different speeds, you can actually see why this cost might be different, because the likelihood of being stuck in a conga line behind a troll is much higher than against a more nimble enemy. And of course, the drawback behind that is that a lot of that depends on what that other entity is blocked by, right? So if I'm blocked by a goblin, sure, the goblin might move fast, but if that goblin is blocked by a troll, well, you know, we're back to the conga line and it's going to be a, it's going to be a disaster. But just a, a nice, for me, where I can, I sort of like to say, okay, so 
did I understand this? If I understood this, I should be able to explain a, a way in which we might adjust that in an interesting or at least non-trivial way. And that's what I came up with. Again, I'm not, I don't think anybody's hiring, for, hiring me for my ideas. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I do want to read this, but I'll read that on my own path, uh, on my own time. Uh, to make use of our new fighter and AI components, we could attach them directly to entity the entity class. However, it might be useful to differentiate between entities that can act and those that can't. Right now, our game only consists of acting entities, but soon enough we'll be adding things like consumable items and eventually equipment, which won't be able to take turns or take damage. One way to handle this is to create a new subclass of entity called actor and give it all the same attributes as entity plus the AI and fighter components we will need. Modify entity.py like this. All right, adding some more typing. So we've got optional tuper, tuple type. Type checking. Okay, so after entity, one thing I haven't really taken advantage of this, but this is actually a nice little way that you can make life easier for long files. Okay, so we are inheriting from entity. We need to do our old friend init. So I think this is about the uh, enforcing keywords. Not quite sure why it doesn't do a comma at the end like all the other ones in this case, but I'm not that fussed about it. Okay, I'm a little suspicious here because I feel like this should already be tabbed in, but anyways, super init. So we're defaulting actors as things that block movement. Self AI, optional, base AI. So it's possible that actors don't have AI, presumably because the player counts as an actor. Self fighter is a fighter. This one's kind of interesting. So we've got return um, bool self.ai. So right now, the way that uh, aliveness seems to be defined, if you hit zero, we take away your AI. I mean, there you go. We've The entity has lost consciousness. You're, you're dead as soon as you get knocked out. <laughs> um, okay, the first thing that our actor uh, class does, oops, sorry, one second here. Uh, the first thing our actor class does in its init function is call its superclasses init, which in this case is the entity class. We're passing blocks movement as true every time because we can assume that all actors will block movement. 
Besides calling the entity init, we also set the two components for the actor class, AI and fighter. The idea is that each actor will need two things to function, the ability to move around and make decisions, and the ability to take and receive damage. This new actor isn't quite enough to get our enemies up and moving around, but we're getting there. We'll actually need to revisit AI.py to add a new class there to handle hostile enemies. Enter the following changes to AI.py. I don't think I saved that before, incidentally, but... Okay, so we're adding type checking now. should also mention that I kind of need to go at 2. I'll, I'll push it off, but I think if I hit 2 o'clock... Um, I'm going to have to, we're all only halfway through the tutorial, so I think I'm going to have to split this over. We knew we were going to split it over videos, but in this case, I don't think I'm going to be getting through um, this. Uh, I don't think I'm getting through part six. Okay, so base AI, we need to take the entity... Now we're making new class of hostile. Okay, presumably this is after uh, get path two. Initializing an empty list. Right, because it's a path. We haven't decided one yet. Uh, perform. Shebyshev distance. Damn. Um, another thing for me to look up on Wikipedia. Um, obviously, from context, right? Max, uh, max distance is just the um, absolute for dx and dy, so it's not super con uh super complicated but the fact that it has a name suggests there's a story okay so visible self entity x i think this is just can we see oops, can we see the thing um So whack the guy if you can see them and they're nearby. You can see how you could extend that distance if you had range weapons of some kind. Of course, all of this is conditional on it being visible. Okay, work through its list. Uh, 
not quite sure where that parentheses came from, but I'm assuming I can get rid of it and return the wait action self entity. Okay, so uh, worth taking a minute to think about what's going on here. So we are performing our action. So we've got our target, we've got the um, distance to our target um, and the max distance. So uh, max, okay, no, actually this makes sense now. So in this case, it's like, am I, am I beside the enemy? Um, either way, that's what's going on there. So can I see the, uh, can I see the target? If I'm in melee range, defined by distance, do the melee action. Because this is a return, um, we have, um, sorry, because we have a, uh, a return action, none of this stuff here um, happens. If we weren't close enough for a melee action, then we set self path, self get path to. Um, so again, did we see the enemy? Okay, yes we did, we can't whack them, so we're setting a path. If a path exists, so again, if I can see you, we have a path. If I can't see you, we don't have a path. Pop the, uh, the path, do the movement from the dest x, dest y from the path perform that action. And if we have run out of actions to take, now this is actually kind of an interesting, this is an implicate, so far as I can tell, there's an interesting implication behind this as well. So what happens if I go, if I'm not visible after the, um, what happens if I'm not visible after they start their move? Well, it doesn't start pers stop pursuing me the second I go. It's not peekaboo, right? They're going to keep going to the last place that they saw me. Um, but if they can't see me after they get to that last place they saw me, then they're going to wait. And you can actually imagine, right? There's sort of a natural extension that you would have here, which is as soon as you stop seeing someone, maybe you have sort of this mental model of roughly where they could go. So you sort of have this expanding circle of potential destinations. And if you don't see them within that circle, like so in your visible areas, if you don't see them in that potential set of, um, of destinations, maybe you move in the opposite direction. You can sort of see how you might enrich um, some of these, uh, some of these choices to introduce the idea of pursuit. Uh, and again, like I'm sure Something tells me the idea of how do you make monsters chase people inside of video games is a very well understood and very highly developed uh, branch of thought. So I do not mean to suggest any of these ideas that I'm coming up with are revolutionizing game design or that it's bad that the tutorial is not including these things. It's just kind of, again, if you can, you learn a new concept. It's like, how would I have, you know, what's something that I might be able to do to take this to another level? That demonstrates that I, I kind of get what's going on, and hopefully that's uh, hopefully that's in line with what the what the program here is doing. So, uh, hostile enemy is the AI class that we will use for our enemies. It defines the perform method, which does the following: if the entity is not in the player's vision, simply wait. If the player is right next to the entity, distance less than or equal to one, attack the player. If the player can see the entity, but the entity is too far away to attack, then move towards the player. The last line actually calls an action that we haven't defined yet, wait action. This action will be used when the player or an enemy decides to wait where they uh, where they are rather than taking a turn. Implement wait action by opening actions.py. So after escape action... Hardest problem in computer science. As you can see, wait action does nothing. Uh, and that's what we want it to do, as it represents an act actor saying, I'll do nothing this turn. With all that in place, we'll need to refactor our entity factories file to make use of the new actor class as well as its components. Modify entity factories to look like this. So one of the things that's kind of interesting when you get to this point in a program 
it's neat to be able to start thinking in terms of concepts more than just, you know, your individual numbers, right? So I'm not really thinking of these entities as hit points and XY coordinates. I'm thinking of them as, you know, orcs and trolls and players. And that's one of the things that I, I always find a bit exciting in terms of programming. And again, I'm not a very good programmer, so I'm only sort of able to get a little bit of the tip of that particular iceberg. Um, but it is always kind of neat when you start um when you start sort of moving into uh, into these areas where you're thinking a little bit more in terms of concepts, because of course, I imagine that people who are trying to make a game, trying to make an experience, are going to be a little bit more effective when they are thinking in terms of the types of experiences that they want people to have. So to a certain extent, it is a lot better for me to say, okay, so imagine, you know, the player runs into this room, they found the amulet, you know, they're, they, they can see that this could be the run which they get. And then as soon as they grab the amulet, you know, six doors open and they're trolls, but they're trolls with faster movement into them. And they need to make a split decision. And let's say, you know, oh, wait, and then somebody says, what if they made it so that as soon as you get the amulet, you we remove the turn-based element that you actually need to run out of the dungeon and the way that we do that idea of running out of the dungeon is you have to actually think fast you can't you can't do it anymore and then some people be oh that's dumb oh that's interesting but everything that's described here now is being pursued by something that wants to hurt you right and that adrenaline and that fear absolutely none of that is saying let's change the dx dy values to be two or you know, let's um, change it, you know, that um, there's a timer on the, there's a timer on the move value or something like that, right? None of that stuff um, is being described. What's being described are sort of emotions and actions and sort of what, what people want uh, people to experience. And again, the hard work of putting those numbers into place has to be done. The game doesn't exist without it. It's a really important part but one of the things that is so interesting about doing programming and why I think it's kind of fun to do projects like this is that you do get to see that evolution from, you know, we're representing these as a whole bunch of different integers and characters on a screen in the case of this roguelike to, you know, this collection of numbers and Unicode is actually something that I feel afraid of, um, you know, and it's not that I think the troll is going to bash down my door and beat me up. It's that um, I've worked very hard. You know, I've hit that magical point where, you know, I, I've failed the game so many times. I finally got the amulet. Now I need to now I know that I need to get out of here. Um, and all of a sudden I'm encountering this new challenge. You know, it's not the dungeon that I successfully went down through and I know that I can beat. Um, it's a totally new dungeon with new dangers. Um, and so I'm sort of seeing this very precious thing that I was looking forward to. Um, you know, now, now this is under threat and I need to think quickly. Um, I have a, a sense of panic. And again, uh, the tools that we use, um, programming. And in the end, um, it's why I wanted to sort of end on this note, specifically the idea of the refactoring that was done at the beginning and this idea of how you choose to represent the world and how easily you can start adding those concepts in. I do actually think that there is a pretty direct line between your ability to think along those lines of an experience that somebody is having um, and um, I, sorry, I think like the, the way that you set these things up um, does create conditions under which you can think more and less effective. Sorry, I'm sort of stumbling over myself trying to say this. But yeah, I think the, the decisions that you make in terms of that setup do actually affect the way that you think about the possibilities and the experiences that people will have. And obviously you want to spend, at least as a designer, presumably, the most time in that wouldn't it be cool if or people are going to love it when you know dot 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 um but in the end um if you if you don't do the work of implementation then that's only ever going to be an idea and people can't play that idea um so i i don't know i think it's kind of like i said i i, I understand that in the context of this tutorial the reason why the um 
the reason why the sorry just one second here I understand why um, people might be a little annoyed with the refactor part way through, presumably also because, you know, the tutorial I'm guessing isn't made in 2024. Um, but I think lying underneath that is uh, a bit of a revelation in terms of how it is easier to add certain ideas with, let's say, the idea of components, which admittedly were added in part six, not in the refactor. Basically, how um, certain decisions in terms of how things are laid out and organized can make make it easier for you to sort of think about and implement ideas. Uh, and of course, if you're working on a team and you happen to have somebody who's a particularly gifted programmer, then presumably being able to communicate uh, those intentions in an effective way, um, you know, allows you to focus on what you're interested in, and then hopefully the programmer is in a in a position where they feel empowered and. Uh, capable of being able to represent the world in these concepts that uh, are sort of in line with um, in line with what uh, not just what you want to do but with what um, what is uh, likely to come down in the future what I'm specifically thinking of here I don't know I, I'm assuming this is true because like there was an image of the model but I'm not quite sure the conditions under which that um, happened but this idea that uh, there's a train ride in um, Fallout and that effectively there was no real way to implement a train. And so essentially what happened was the train became a hat on a character and effectively you are sitting in a train hat on top of a character who it, it just has a very, very steady walking path. And this is just sort of an indication where certain decisions were made that made it... Um, made it difficult to implement something that people felt was important. Um, and I mean, to a certain extent, it's sometimes fun to see the, the clever ways in which people get around these sorts of problems. But on the other hand, uh, it does also sort of represent a bit of a shame in which the tools did not, um, did not necessarily allow for an idea to be implemented in a straightforward and helpful way. Presumably they've solved this for Starfield and I suspect Skyrim, you're probably also not, you know, sitting on a cart hat. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's nice. It, I, I think these are opportunities to just sort of see how this, um, how this sort of stuff actually gets done in the real world as opposed to it just being some weird story you heard about Fallout, for instance. Anyways, I'm going to stop yapping i figure i should either be doing more of this tutorial we're at the halfway point or uh i should go out um i'm gonna go out but thank you everybody for watching excuse me i'm boring myself thank you everybody for hanging out i will try and record the next part of this in a few hours um so at the very least if i can i'd like to get six and seven done in one big go but um it is not immediately clear to me how tricky the next few steps are going to be and whether or not part seven is going to be like part six but either way we're going through this all the way to the end uh, i hope you have a good evening and we'll see you in the next one take care